Let me start by a quick introduction here. So who in this room is an engineer or hardware designer or hacker or semiconductor engineer? Just give us a, and this is not precluding, there's, there's of course software people and we all do things which we find elegant, beautiful, because we understand what's in it. So, has anyone ever been frustrated by this problem? You've had to explain something technical to a non-technical person, maybe a family member, or you're, it's those awkward party conversations, right? Maybe some of us avoid parties for this very reason. There's a whole lot of stuff in here, and we appreciate it. We value it. We've worked hard to get it into here, and yet, most other people out there just have no clue and don't care. They just want to pull out their phone and use it, uh, sit down at their computer and play a game or browse the web, and they, they don't necessarily appreciate all the years and the geniuses standing on the shoulders of other geniuses, standing on the shoulders of other geniuses. Well. What do you do? For me, this book was an answer. I'm like, the, the minute I saw that this was coming out, this is going to be the centerpiece of my coffee table in my house. This is my copy right here. And today I have a, an honor and a privilege of speaking to the authors of this absolutely stunning work. So, these guys, uh, Eric and Wendell. Uh, Wendell, you're a co-founder of Evil Mad Scientists. Is any, anyone else here an Evil Mad Scientists fan? Yeah, you've heard of it. Um, and so you're obviously very technically minded, but you're also an absolutely fabulous photographer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and photographing things that are very difficult. And we have... Eric Schlepfer here as well, who was in the last talk, who was here for the Apollo Guidance Computer Talk. Some of you. Um, I don't know how either of you find the time to do all the things you do. You both are so prolific. Not very well. <laughs> uh, I, I'm at an age now where just personally I'm not exactly in shape. Uh, I find it hard to stay up late. But in my mind, the only way to do these sorts of things you guys do is to go without sleep. How close to the truth is that? I definitely could be getting more sleep, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Eric is also known on the social media space as Tube Time. Anyone follow Tube Time on YouTube? Yeah. Or uh, Twitter or, uh, well, Twitter. Mastodon is kind of the preferred uh, social network now. Um, so let's just start a, a little bit of background. Uh, I'll start with you, Wendell. Um, how did you get started in this space, and, and what, what would you say is the central thread of your career up to this point? Uh, I've had a bit of a varied career. I started out uh, as an atomic physicist, actually, and uh, I had some hobby projects at some point that kind of got out of hand, and I started doing the hobby projects more and more, and eventually, I quit my day job to just do the hobby projects full time, and now so uh, we did a made a kit business selling electronic soldering kits, and it was through things related to that where I met Eric, and Eric and I have been collaborating on these uh, kits for the last uh, decade or so, and uh, so it sort of led us somewhat naturally towards the book a few years ago. That's that's really cool. So roughly. What, when, this, and I assume that that's how Evil Mad Scientist got its, got its start, right? So uh, when did that start and how did it look for you transitioning out of your regular or previous full-time employment to being more entrepreneurial with what was previously a hobby? Well, it started just as a project blog in 2006 where I was documenting projects that I was doing. Uh, and so these were a lot of crafting and electronics projects, sometimes reverse engineering projects, sometimes robotics projects. Uh, but um, 
we started making some kits to sell just sort of because people kept asking us, how can I do this myself? And that's the part that got out of hand eventually. Um, who, are the, who would you say are the main audience for those today? And has that evolved over time? It has definitely evolved, whereas the, uh, at the early days of it, uh, it was mainly things like soldering kits and Arduino-type devices. What I work on primarily nowadays is making pen plotters, actually. Uh, the the AxiDraw family of pen plotters is what I do full-time now. That, that's a, a very distant arc, some might think, but also very, very cool. So, uh, Eric, how about some background on how you got to this place of writing a book? And, and you're still very actively involved in full-time software development, or you, you're embedded hardware now, uh, yeah, software hardware. for a long time. So give us some of your story and background up to this present day as well. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a long story, but uh, you know, if we kind of fast forward to when I had the idea for doing the book, it came down to a repair job. So I had a piece of test equipment that I was using on my bench, and it just stopped working one day. Like I plug it in, and like bad smells coming out. Obviously, something's burning, right? Not great. So I start taking it apart, and I start digging around, and I found a resistor that had gone up in smoke. And resistors don't just randomly fail, typically. Usually, there's something else that causes them to dissipate too much power. And I'm looking around, and sure enough, there's a little tantalum capacitor next to it. So I pull that out and look at it, and it's a dead short, right? It's obviously just a failed tantalum. And if any of you collect computers, you'll probably have that happen to you before, right? Or maybe you, uh, at some point you will. So I'm looking at it thinking, you know, I wonder if it's possible to see how it broke by cutting it in half. Because if you're ever involved in hardware design, there's a whole process around failure analysis where you'll take an item and you'll cross-section it and look at it under a microscope to see what went wrong. And so I went and took some sandpaper and just kind of scrubbed away for a while and looked at it and looked at it under, under a microscope and saw absolutely nothing wrong. And then I thought, well, I don't know, it looks kind of neat. I'll take a picture and I'll put it on Twitter. And a lot of other people thought it looked really neat. A lot of people. So then I started digging through my lab, finding other components and cutting those in half and putting photos of those on Twitter. And it really started to take off. And then pretty soon there were like 20 people that were like, dude, you should make a coffee table book about this. By the way, uh, after we did the book, I went and tracked down every single one of those people and I said, here's the link to the book. That's good. That's, that's what you call product marketing, when you see a, a demand and you actually focus in and pursue that. So, um, again, Wendell, you, you, you already gave a little background about how you guys knew each other, but how did you guys meet and then um, smash cut that to... Eric, how did you know Wendell was the perfect co-author for this? Um. Uh, Eric and I were uh, sort of people who bumped into each other at uh, events in Silicon Valley once in a while, but it was at an analog aficionado's dinner uh, that we went to where uh, he had brought his breadboard 555, which was a literal giant chunk of oak that he had soldered a discrete transistor 555 out of uh, 2N3904s and 3906s and uh, just bare flying resistors in space, and I had brought uh, also a 555, but mine was a, a giant wooden model of a 555 dip. It was a made of laminated plywood that I cut in my CNC router and glued together and sanded and painted. And he set his thing on top of my thing. We're like, you know what we should do? <laughs> and uh, a couple of years later, we came out with a, uh, this 555 discrete transistor soldering kit that sort of had his uh, uh, circuit diagram re-implemented as an easy-to-make circuit board now. Um, and uh, a bit of my uh, artistic design for what the shape of the kit would be, and it had these folded sheet metal legs and so on. Um, it was, and that was the first of a few cal collaborations we've done. And so the book was sort of a natural one after a lot of those. Yeah, because I, I definitely had been familiar with the photography work that you'd done for the website, and so I knew that you had that 
skill, far more than me. I, I, I will occasionally take pictures, but I'm nowhere near as uh, experienced as you are. So just coming on to some of the examples of what you might find in this book, and uh, it, it is truly beautiful. Now, I like have a lot of circuit design. I, ca I came from the EDA industry in simulation and printed circuit layout. And, uh, but by training a computer systems engineer, so I, how I ended up down the PCB rabbit hole and signal integrity, I, it's odd to me, but life has strange twists and turns. Uh, but that, that's why I, I gravitated towards some of these cross sections. Now I've seen sectional views of boards usually from factories to prove to you that they're making what you designed as you designed it. Because as if any of you were here and heard some of Jerry's talk this morning, you know if something goes offshore to go to mass production, very often they'll change it or really odd things can happen. Like they'll get layer, the copper, the copper patterns for the different layers may be out of order. And so what was designed and you put many hours into getting perfect and then simulating it and making sure your signal integrity was all good can fail in production. So one of the things that we do, which is pretty common, is a, a section. And you embed a sample coupon in some epoxy, you cut it, you polish it down, and you look at it to make sure they've, they've gotten your layer stack in the right order, and you can measure the dimensions of the traces in cross-section to make sure they're meeting your impedance requirements. Um, so what I see in the book here is, is reminiscent to a degree of some of those things, but I think there are some very different techniques that you guys turned to. Would you share with us um, Tackling this kind of problem, when you want to cut things apart and specifically get a very close up, very crystal clear image to reveal the inner workings of some of these things. Yeah. What were the, what was the, how did you come across the approach and what were some of the challenges you faced? Sure. Yeah. The, uh, the thing that you talked about with the test coupons is really good because that was uh, kind of a partial inspiration for, for cutting into these boards. But we never really liked what those pucks looked like. I've got this bag of like maybe 80 of these little pucks that the circuit board factory send to us with a circular cutouts and perfect cross section, and sometimes some ugly epoxy. But, but yes, it's great for measuring the dimensions, but it's not great for showing the character in the same way that a uh, off-axis photo like this is. Yeah, it just looks odd and because you've got this plastic around it and it turns yellow over time. It, it's not really photogenic. Like it's interesting technically, but it's not really all that artistic. And so the challenge here was how can we take a circuit board and cross-section it without making that same mistake? How can we make it look really good on the page? And so that's kind of what we're going for here. And so this is not embedded in a blob of epoxy. So. In my mind, and I'm no expert, embedding something in epoxy is so that it's stable while you polish it. Um, so you actually made things, I think, possibly much more difficult for yourselves to prepare these. Uh, so how on earth do you get that so perfect? So th this, this image is a great example because you've, you've chosen an area of the board cutting across some through vias so people can see the characteristics of the plated through holes uh, with their ENIG coating surface finish. And I see the fiber weave, I see the copper, everything's bright and shiny, how I, I would see it in 3D CAD. How on earth did you get it so clean and perfect like that? Oh, uh, well, I just have Wendell do it all in post. <laughs> No, that's a joke. So we actually did spend a lot of time perfecting our polishing technique. And the thing about doing a like professional failure analysis is that it's all about the volume. You want to get the stuff done as quickly as possible. You want the section to be good enough for evaluation purposes, but you don't want to waste any time on that. 
for the book, we had to go above and beyond what anyone would do for that kind of an analysis. And so we used uh, basically many, many hours of polishing and super fine grit sandpaper to get each of these samples so that they looked really, really good up close. And so I would do a lot of the polishing, take the sample, send it over to you, and then you'd kick it back and say, sorry, it's not good enough. It's like, well, a couple more hours, more staring at under a microscope and, to see and, if it's perfect. And worst, after doing that quite a few times, we didn't end up using the subject. Yeah, there's a couple photos in there where if you look through the book really carefully, you might be able to see a little bit of dust and dirt and uh, maybe some very fine scratches, but uh, we tried to get most of those out. Did you uh, t uh, turn to any specialized cleaning processes? You might want to get closer to your microphone. Sorry. Yeah, not close enough to the mic. Did you turn, have to turn to any specialized cleaning processes? Because polishing things, you end up with dust, as you mentioned. And yeah, the worst of them were um, sometimes when you had wire bonds, we'd get dust on the wire bonds. And so uh, at one point, I had a really great sample, except that we had some dust from the uh, polishing process that was stuck on these wire bonds. So I spent hours under the microscope with a, uh, with a bottle of very clean alcohol and a brush made of a single cat whisker uh, and got all those dust pieces off, and that's sometimes what it takes. Was, was no cats your... were harmed in this process. She's a very <laughs> sweet cat. She sheds whiskers, as they do. It's actually an extremely clever approach. Just pick up something that you would normally want to get rid of and find a very clever use for it. And that's what we do as engineers and scientists, right? Um, so here's another one uh, that it, this is only a four layer board, typical of what you might get from, say, a Spark Fun module or something like that. Again, these are, these are terrific, and I can't see why educa educators wouldn't pick up on the work you've done and use it. I really like this image, too. In particular, uh, there's some fun details you can see. Uh, you can kind of see that our polishing maybe uh, could have been a little bit better in some of these spots right in here. But what I really wanted to point out is that the uh, solder mask film is actually getting kind of sucked into the via barrel a little bit. And so it's just all those little details and imperfections that you can see in a finished manufactured product that kind of let you know, here's how they built this real thing. Like, it's, it's a very manual process. Uh, there are physical things happening in the factory. And by looking at those little flaws, you can kind of work out how they did it. It's very fascinating. This also reveals how they made the solder mask, because modern boards, solder mask is actually liquid, and it's sprayed on. So you, you see it go down the larger via barrels. Obviously, it was sprayed on. Yeah. Older products, if you're ever cross-sectioning a circuit board from the mid-'80s, the solder mask film, if it's a tented via, won't go down the hole because it was actually a film that was laminated first, and then they had a subtractive process. So. So this is the other side of this, that you're revealing how things are made to a degree as well. Um, what, were, what were some of the other challenges with, so for example, in this one, you actually, okay, now we're getting good at this. We'll do a multi-layer, more complex product. We want to see how the whole stack goes together with, with chips. Um, this, this had to have been very difficult to get right as well. Yeah. Uh, I, this is a memory dim from a computer that I took out at some point and uh, probably cut this about six or eight different places to get a place through it that looked just right and had the vias just right. And you could see that silicon and you can see that uh, uh, structure of that package. Yeah, we did a lot of exploratory cuts. So if we got an item for the very first time, we just cut into it at some random spot and then look at it and go, well, that's not very photogenic. Let's keep trying. And so we'd make multiple cuts again and again until we found one that really spoke to us. And that's the sample that we uh, took a picture of. Well, many pictures. <laughs> um, did you, what, what was the journey with getting it right with the photography equipment? What process did you have to go through and did you have to acquire anything special to get it done right? 
Um, for pictures, uh, this is not a great example because it doesn't have great depth of field, but for some of the pictures that do have this immense depth of field, we used a technique called focus stacking, which is where you take a whole bunch of different photographs with the camera at slightly different positions and uh, use some computer software to meld those together, a little bit like how you stitch together a panorama from neighboring photos. This uh, calculates the FFT, figures out what's in focus, and stitches together all the in-focus parts of all the photos. And uh, so in order to use that, I built a robotic stage that we mount the camera on, and that's automated through some software that moves the camera forward a, a tenth of a millimeter, takes a photograph, uh, moves forward, waits for the camera to stabilize, takes the photograph, and in some cases where we were doing things that had both things like LEDs, but also had to use intense flash lighting for tiny subjects, we had to uh, do a flash and a long exposure of 30 seconds in some ambient lighting, and then move the camera. By the way, if you're curious, there's an entire chapter at the end of the book that discusses in detail the methods that we used along with the equipment. So if you want to look at some very fancy macro lenses, then uh, turn to the last couple of pages of the book. Right. Oh, this is a great one. I, this, I really like this one because of the uh, capacitor uh, down here. So this sort of ripply effect that you can see right here is because you're looking at layers in the multi-layer ceramic capacitor and they're kind of getting sliced, but it's not perfectly flat. And so you get this sort of ripply effect. So each one of those is a microscopically thin layer of deposited metal. It's really quite something once you realize what it is that you're looking at. Yeah, it's great. This looks like an inductor over here as well, uh -huh. part of a DC to DC converter. Yes, and all those blind and buried vias here that you can see, uh, quite a complex board for um, a good example. That's now, out of a smartphone, by the way. Right, so this is, this is the same board, I think, that lent itself to the cover? That's correct. correct. Yeah, absolutely stunning. When I first looked at that, I couldn't help but thinking the, the little uh, clip that's been cut into there on the side, there's one underneath. Of course, they are absolutely minuscule, but next to... That little guy up there, right? That's right. Yep. Ne next, next to... Wh when you see it close up like this, my brain kept telling me it's a fuse holder. No. <laughs> that's less than a millimeter tall. Yeah. It's really, really tiny. It's a clip that was used to hold the EMI shield over the SOC in order to meet the FCC regulations. And what, what was the phone that you used for this one? It was not a very recent one, I imagine. Uh, I think it was a Nexus 5X, I want to say. Sounds right. Yeah. You want to hack into something that's not too expensive or worth anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but still we we also, across. for kind of weird reasons, had about five of these we could take apart. I also appreciate in this one, the, you, you can see the epoxy infill. Now, this is what a lot of people don't realize, that even, cons even consumer devices that have to be cost engineered to the nth degree to be affordable, they still go to great trouble many of, in many of these products to make them quite reliable or more reliable. Absolutely, and that's why that's there, is because uh, if anyone's ever dropped your cell phone, I've never dropped my cell phone, knock on wood, but if you drop it and you don't crack the screen, it still works because of that underfill. If that wasn't there and you dropped your phone at just the wrong angle, it could break the solder balls and then it would lose the connection and then the phone probably wouldn't boot, certainly wouldn't work. Yep, just stunning work. Now, getting to electromechanical, these, these pro provide somewhat of a different challenge with boards and boards with semiconductors mounted on them. You've got some fairly hard materials, so the harder something is, the longer it'll take to polish, but it's easier to polish. What were some of the challenges you ran into with electromechanical devices? Well, in one like this, and Eric did all the polishing on this one, uh, the difference between those super hard beryllium copper parts there versus the super soft ABS plastic parts, that is a really challenging thing to polish all at once and get the things to the same level of polish and coplanarity. Yeah, this one I cheated a little bit and the uh, disc in the tact switch, I actually removed it and polished it separately and then reinserted it. 
So if I tried to sand it all at once, it would just get torn out and, and torn to shreds. So that was uh, kind of the trick here is to take it apart. And then uh, once each of the individual parts was polished up and in good shape and clean, then I just reassembled it for this uh, sort of a tactful display. It's truly beautiful. It looks like an RS Components 3D model with the coloring. Uh, this, is, this is one of my favorites, uh, a, a cross section of a speaker, but it looks like you took a slice out of the center rather than just cut it in half. That's right, and for this one we actually did embed it in epoxy in order to be able to get that slice. We have these uh, wispy parts, the paper cone and the woven backer behind it uh, that gives it that flexible hinge, uh, and also these super fine magnet wires on their paper uh, cylinder, and all of those parts will move out of the way immediately if you let them, so. Uh, right, this so. Is this is one of those cases where the distraction of the plastic was a good trade-off in terms of getting the overall character of the device that we wanted. Yeah, this one was really, really challenging to get right. Uh, there's a magnet in there, and so as we're polishing it, all the little filings that come off stick to the magnet, and we have to just keep cleaning it off. It, it even stuck it was, to the saw blade. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was not great. Has, I'm curious, has anyone in here ever reconed a speaker? I've done it. It's it's quite uh, a job for people with more patience than me. <laughs> because that's exactly the problem you have. And uh, it's, it's, yeah, I can imagine the challenge. So that's what we can see around here. This is the epoxy encasing. And it looks like that there was, there was some air bubbles that got stuck in the dust cap. But that is still just a tremendous work of art you've got there. We learned a lot making the book. Uh, the process of embedding a part in resin was not something either of us really done before. Maybe you had done it, I don't remember. Only trivially. <laughs> yeah, so there was something that took a lot of practice uh, to kind of figure it out. And the bubbles were a huge problem. So we did it in a vacuum pot and it just felt like it was an infinite source of bubbles. Like we would pump it down, you get all this foam and bubbles and then eventually it starts to go away and then you pump it down further and they get more and more bubbles and it was, it was very challenging. Well, if you want to store a lot of bubbles, a surface like this, the paper surface with all of these infinite cracks in it is a great way to do that. Yeah, exactly. That's why they don't use paper in space, maybe? <laughs> yeah, so epoxy embedding, not easy, not easy. Those who've done kitchen surfaces would know as well. There's a lot, a lot of the time is spent uh, heating the surface as well to get bubbles to come out. So heating's another way. Yeah. Okay, any, anyone recognize this device? Say it louder. Yeah, this is a tuning fork. Tuning fork. So this is getting on the smaller side. Again, with a, with a printed circuit board as a substrate, that's one thing because you can, you can cut through components and it's kind of a bit easier to, s everything's held in place, more or less. This one looks quite challenging. Was this embedded or, or freestanding? This is freestanding. Uh, the challenge here is that it has a hermetic glass seal at the base. So that's that little green thing that you can kind of see uh, down there on the right. And it is much harder than the soft metal and so the challenge is to cut in and polish that evenly. And so you get a cross section that's uh, directly across rather than at some weird angle. And also to do it without destroying the tuning fork assembly or vibrating it to the point that it cracks. Uh, this was not the first try. Uh, so also on a sealed can, you always have to wonder if you're approaching it from the right direction to get that clean cut. And also, wow, that dust loves to stick to that uh, quartz. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, this one's neat because you can also see the, I think it's laser trimming there at the end. Yeah, the tips, of the, uh, the tips of the fork have that little scratch on them. And that's not a scratch, that's a little laser tuning, fine tune uh, artifact from getting that crystal frequency just right. It's really neat to see those little hidden gems of manufacturing process that turn up in here. Every little detail here is engineered. Somebody worked hard on that. 
So if you move the uh, little dot there, there you go. Yeah, you got it. So right here, this, this line that passes the top of the tuning fork uh, metal, I guess, with the, uh, is that silver plating they use in those? I'm not sure what the surface I, is. I don't know what the metal is. It might be chrome. Chrome. And so, yeah, that's a laser cut across the top to tune the frequency. Very cool. And this is a neat one, one of my favorites in the book. So a, a recording head. I thought we were going to see how many people recognized it for what I'm it sorry. is. <laughs> I, should have, I should have asked. But of course, this is how I, I can see my entertainment here. growing up. There's just so much detail in here. There's a lot going on because you, you can actually see the entire magnetic circuit. Because yes, it is a tape head, but it is a magnetic circuit. So there's that uh, sort of loop there in the middle where it goes from the head. And you can kind of see where the wires wound around it on a plastic uh, bobbin. But I think, to me, the most fascinating part of this image is that there is an incredibly fine piece of gold foil right at the tip. And that is what creates the gap in the head and controls the high frequency response of it. And so the thinner the gap you can make it, the more sensitive it is to high frequencies that are recorded on the tape. Yeah, it's truly amazing. Still on that magnetic circuit theme. Now, here's one of these things that we uh, did a lot of test cuts through. We we went to uh, a surplus store um, back when we had surplus stores in Silicon Valley. Excess Solutions. Anybody like that place? And, yeah. All right. And uh, we went and we bought uh, just uh, bags full of. Um, capacitors and transformers and things and went through a whole bunch of these trying to get the perfect Anything that cut. looked cool. <laughs> now this would have been quite a challenge as well with all those layers of um, capped on tape. Actually the yellow stuff is polyethylene I believe. And then you've got very dense, very ex extremely hard ferrite material and uh, somewhere in between probably glass filled plastic uh, but I, I really like this one too because if you are ever doing power electronics, you realize this has been designed to isolate for safety and safety certification. So um, you can really see what's been, and not just that too, but layers of different windings and ordering. Now, normally we see all this in a textbook and someone's just drawn it with line draw drawings and it's, you, yeah, you understand what they're talking about, but it's not reality. This really gives you another depth. They have an isolation shield in this transformer between the primary and secondary windings. And it's a little difficult to see because it's sandwiched in between layers of the uh, capped on tape but it's gonna be in between the very fine diameter windings and the much larger uh, secondary windings. I think, also think it's really interesting that there's a full five different diameters of wire they used here. Why did they optimize it quite that much? I gotta wonder, is that really a better trade-off than using a fewer number of uh, winding steps? But Yeah, it's hard to say. This was probably designed for a multi-output switching power supply. And so each one of those winding diameters, at least on the secondary side, would have been for a different voltage and presumably a different current. Yeah, if, the, if there's anyone here with power electronics or magnetics design, let us know. We'd, we'd love to quiz your... These your were typically made as one-offs for yeah. a specific power supply design. And because we're buying the surplus, you know, it's gonna have some house part number on it and who knows what it was designed to go into. Mm -hmm. But presumably some kind of uh, multi-output switching power supply. Now, talking about tube time, <laughs> <laughs> this had to have been very challenging. Uh, first of all, where was this, th this, this looks like a guitar amp or part of a guitar amp. Um, it is a guitar amplifier. It's actually my brother. He's a professional musician, and he has a small collection of little uh, combo tube amps. 
and he was uh, gracious, enough, gracious enough to loan me one for uh, photography purposes. Even when he knew you were cutting apart components? He did, he was a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the tubes is another level because now you're dealing with uh, easily fractured glass envelopes, um, very fine elements. So I really did appreciate what you had accomplished with this one. How did you go about this and uh, basically did, did you have to go through a bunch of tubes to get this right or did you know by now what was involved? Uh, we made a few false starts, but uh, for this particular one, once we made our plan for it, it went according to plan, basically on the first try. Uh, I actually held, handheld this tube while and rotated around by hand next to a low-speed diamond saw to cut through and cut off that top. And then we essentially pried off the rest, the top mica washer and uh, other parts up there with pliers. So it's relatively low tech. One was hoping uh, you had body protection while doing this because getters in tubes are very toxic, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> We're not advocating people try this at home. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to take one for the team. The, <laughs> the, uh, the, the Nixie tubes are going to have mercury in them, which is even worse than this. Yes. Now, I don't, I don't have that in my gallery for the talk today, but definitely get the book, get the book. And if you're not convinced, uh, there's a couple of copies in consignment, so you can uh, take a look for yourself and uh, maybe even uh, decide to walk out with one. Yep, and I have one up here as well. So, this is cool too, so not Wait, just... can anyone guess what this is? Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask. <laughs> what is this? Cobb, okay. That was quick. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's what I found interesting too. I, I had some of these break at home and so naturally I took a closer look and then actually snipped one of these off and hooked it up to my lab. I think before lab. saying that, you should say out loud what it actually is, uh, which <laughs> is the uh, filament from one of these LED filament light bulbs, uh, consumer grade. It's called a cob, which is a chip on board. It's made on a very thin, very narrow ceramic circuit board, and the individual LED dice are glued onto it and then bonded out with very tiny bond wires. And then the whole thing is coated in sort of a, uh, a rubbery compound that contains a phosphor. Uh, you see underneath, this is actually a blue LED. These are blue LED dice, but because of that phosphor coating, the phosphor emits light in the green and red spectrum. And so to our eye, it appears to be white when it's actually a mix of different colors. And this is, this is why I had certain family members objecting to me switching to LED. They're like, the color isn't right. I'm like, look at it, it's warm white. But the CRI isn't, isn't exactly the same as a, as a filament, but I prefer LED, that's just me. And speaking of which, this had to have been very tricky. You cut into something just enough to still be able to use it and get the photo you want. So how many LEDs did you go through to make this? <laughs> uh, just this one. So I was successful the first time, but it was mainly paranoia. So if, if you saw me sitting there at my, at my bench, I'd have our, uh, had a little chunk of aluminum because I needed a flat surface, a piece of sandpaper, uh, a little bit of isopropyl alcohol so that I would be wet sanding it, not dry sanding it, so it keeps the dust down. And right next to me is a microscope, and so I'd do a little bit of sanding, put it under the microscope, look at it, how much more do I have to go, go back to the sandpaper a little bit more, and then back under the microscope. And so through that sort of iterative process, I was able to get it as close as I dared to those bond wires. And, uh, and then for the photography, we would have a little power supply and a resistor and hook that up. And, and so, uh, get just the right balance of light. That took a lot of playing. <laughs> yeah, uh, adjusting the color for brightness. And this is one of those shots where it's both got the flash and the long exposure to get everything matched just right. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, amazing how even then, how much more sensitive 
even the camera is to the green chip versus the red, or so it appears. Maybe that's our interpretation of the photo as well, but it just looks a lot brighter. Yeah, I believe that's true. Most cameras are uh, designed to be sensitive to light the same way that the human eye is sensitive to it. And so they typically have a correction function in there that makes them more sensitive to green than to uh, red or blue. And speaking more of LEDs, now this is where it gets into the retro tech too, although I don't know if this particular device is retro. Share with us a bit of information about what this device was and how you came about this image here. Uh, this is an uh, 1980s, I believe, uh, military grade uh, alphanumeric LED display that uh, I found at a surplus store. And uh, it has these remarkable, huge, huge dies. They must be uh, uh, five millimeters tall. Um, and uh, it is in this wondrous package that has this heavy metal bottom side and thick glass top side and this hermetic seal around it and the hermetic seal around every single pin. And uh, I shudder to think what these cost the government when they bought them. But um, I, they were designed for high reliability, obviously. An interesting thing about this one is that it's got uh, a decimal point on each die. And it's also got that decimal point upside down, but they weren't wired in place. So it's as though this die could have been put upside down or right side up and still worked there. Or perhaps used as a colon separator for uh, a time, if that's what the chip was used for. It's, it's truly beautiful, truly beautiful. Silica substrate. Um, and you, so that's the nice thing too. The book is not only cross sections. There's just some fabulous photography in here of close-ups of interesting aspects of devices. And again, LED, obviously a matrix array, and you can, this is just really cool to see up close and personal how the, the multiplexing was done with these, or is done with these. You can literally still buy these on DigiKey. This one? This one's still available. Yeah, it's a little expensive, though. So what kind of, uh, what did you have to do to get this photo in terms of exposure and uh, lens, aperture, that sort of thing? Um, this photo uses focus stacking, so uh, it's uh, an array of uh, images that are composited together at slightly different depths, so we can have this essentially infinite depth of field here. And the exposure is, I believe, the same on all these. This does not also do exposure stacking uh, or HDR photography as we did in some cases. But uh, this is just as it looks, just um, exposing with the LEDs fairly long, low power on them, plus a flash. We also took it apart. It comes with a plastic lens that's uh, sort of glued on top, and so we had to pull that off so that we could get a really clear view and, uh, and show that to you all. I think the lens was, was the trick of how some of those op opto-electronic displays um, really work for the end user because if, if you have a look around and see some of the 19, late 1970s handheld calculators, they all used multiplexed LED displays, but they were tiny, tiny little digits and you think, how could anyone read what they're doing here? But each digit had a lens over it that essentially was your magnifying glass. So, and cables are also very difficult to do. What, what was the process you adopted for these? Yeah, that, that was a trick. Uh, we experimented with a bunch of techniques. Uh, on a lot of these, I ended up soaking them with a little bit of glue to kind of hold things together. Uh, because if you're going in there and you're cutting and polishing it, they can kind of slide apart. And so the glue would help uh, make things uh, sort of intact. But it was a lot of polishing and a lot of cleaning. Yeah, this was depending on the type of cable. Uh, for some of them, we did actually use this light amount of potter, or in some cases, some full potting uh, in order to immobilize the cable so they wouldn't move around while you're polishing them. Uh, in a couple cases, the picture is just the first 
cut with a brand new razor blade, just pushing it straight through. And in some cases, it is the work of spending an absurd amount of time cleaning after using sandpaper and so on. So it really, depending on the context, these were not very well behaved. No, not at all. And what would happen was that you get tiny little fragments of copper, and they would kind of get stuck in the gaps in between the wires in the cables. And you could see that. And so we had to go in there and get all of that cleaned out. Yeah, certainly no easy task. And this is probably my favorite in the whole book. So this is a uh, modern USB-C cable uh, that has this well, super speed, uh, 10 gigabit per second or so. And you can see that uh, inside the little tiny foil in the center, there is a green wire, a white wire, and a, a ground wire. And that is essentially a buried secret USB 2.0 cable uh, in the center of everything else. And then those eight large micro coaxes, each made of uh, uh, seven wires in the center plus a, a wrapped shield is a coax cable. And two of those together make a differential pair for sending the high-speed data over the USB 3. This is a high-performance cable. This is not the, the cheap cable that you get off of Valley Express or something. So this is when you need the 10 gigabit per second data rate. But yes, these are actual tiny, micro, almost microscopically small coaxial cables. And uh, that's a regular ballpoint pen for scale. Yeah, it's, it's impressive how those coaxes maintain their shape so well. They must put a lot of engineering into the dielectric. Absolutely. To keep them absolutely perfect. And what I really like about this too, it's you see with the the, the coax shields, how perfectly or close to perfectly circular they are. There's no overlap among any of the, the shield wires. Each of those shields is also wrapped with a color-coded foil. The each, each of those eight also has a different color, perfectly fine wrapper, and it's so flawless you can't even hardly see it in this cross-section. So what you're saying is it's worth paying extra for the high-quality cables. Absolutely. You won't know until you cut it in half. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is I could buy cheap cables from China and sell them as, anyway, 40. Well, this would probably do 40 gigabits if it, uh, how, how would this be different from, say, a Thunderbolt class uh, USB-C top cable? The basic construction should be very similar. Uh, Technically, you could get higher speeds out of this. It's just you know, the distance that you can transmit will be limited. And there's other tricks they do to get more, uh, more than just 10. It may also have to do with the chips at either end of the cable. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and so that, that would be another interesting one, too, to cross-section the USB-C connectors because, as, as we've discussed, some of these things, they have repeaters built in. Mm -hmm. It's the only way to do the distance you want to do. And uh, regular end users have no idea what's inside this stuff. No clue. That's very, very impressive. I like this one. This is from the website. There's a, an outtakes section on the website if anyone's interested. Um, so I, I can see a capacitor glued to a, a plate. Did this method fail or this is just uh, we want to show what we're doing halfway through? Um, so that's showing two slices through a green polyester film capacitor, and that film capacitor cross-section actually is in the book. So okay. uh, this is just showing the method. The uh, capacitor is affixed to this chunk of aluminum with some pure beeswax, and those cuts through it are made on our uh, low-speed diamond saw. So we cut through the capacitor right through down into the aluminum, and then we free up the part and clean it up and polish it. And hence the use of beeswax. It's removable, so I appreciate that. Where, what, so when you say low-speed diamond saw, what kind of speeds are we talking? Um, say 10, um, 10 to a few hundred RPM. Yeah, so it really is low speed, as if cutting it by hand, but more perfectly. Um, this type of saw is, is typically used for materials analysis, so it's one of the types that is commonly used for things like cutting those test coupons of PCBs mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. on, or, or for mineral or bone samples. Very good, very good. Uh, I like some of the connector 
ones as well. These must have been quite challenging. This one here is a plug on a 1394 cable, I believe. Uh, yeah, this is actually a Firewire cable, and this is one of the outtakes on our website. This is from a subject that did not make it into the book. We really, really liked the way these pictures came out, but we did decide at some point to cull the weakest photos from the book, and this is one of the subjects that just didn't make it in. So, so there's two places people can go. Um, now, we're, we're basically out of time. Did anyone else have any questions for these marvelous authors? If not, you, these, these, all that I've included in the slides today, you can actually find on the book website as well. But it, again, there's more in the book that's not there and vice versa. So definitely check them out. This is what appears to be the diamond <coughs> saw here cutting into a relay, this is where you can get it. And uh, thank you guys very much for coming and, and sharing some of your knowledge and techniques with us today. I appreciate it a lot. And again, check, check these out on consignment. While these guys are here for a very short time, you might actually get them signed. I believe they're already signed, right? There you go, already signed. Or the signed, other signed copies at the Evil Mad Scientist website as well, right? All right, thank you. Thank you.